Hello everyone and welcome to Mountain Lake Journal. I'm Tom Halley. In late summer, Lake Champlain is often prone to algae blooms that can cover bays and shorelines with a thick green slime. And while it may be smelly and unpleasant to swim in, much of it is harmless. But there are certain types of blue-green algae blooms that have a bacteria that make them toxic. For the past few years, researchers at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center and UVM have been looking into a possible connection between those blue-green algae blooms and abnormally high rates of ALS, better known as Lou Gehrig's disease, in towns along the shores of Lake Champlain. The studies, which the researchers believe point to a link, are the subject of a new documentary airing next week on Mountain Lake PBS by Jim and Jackie Heltz, father and daughter filmmakers from Vermont. all started about maybe eight years ago when I had some students who wanted a project to work on, some undergraduate students. So I had them map out all our ALS patients that we had in our data banks. And we found some areas where it looked like the ALS was clustering. And one of those was Lake Muscoma, which is just a little east of here in New Hampshire. We did some calculations and found that there was about a 40 times higher incidence of ALS there. Thank you. Uh, we weren't sure what, what the link would be there, um, but obviously just the water body being there seemed like a possible target. So we were asking a lake biologist, Jim Haney, who's over at UNH, and he said, well, you know that that lake has annual cyanobacterial blooms. Dr. Stumble cares about what everyday people are exposed to and whether it causes disease later on in their lives. He is interested in whether aerosolization of cyanobacteria could potentially cause this neurotoxin called BMAA or beta n methylaminoalanine protein misfolding over large periods of time of exposure. So theoretically what we're trying to do is putting together cyanobacteria exposure, it getting into the human body, and then potentially neurodegenerative disease. We're trying to look at cyanobacteria um, cell counts over a water body over about six hours worth of time, because um, then you can compare the filter with one tissue. So we know that cyanobacteria can present a risk to people if they come in contact with water that contains cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria cells can cause rashes and skin irritations. We also know that cyanobacteria can create toxins inside their cells. So that means if people swallow this water, if they drink water containing cyanobacteria or the toxins, they could become sick. In 2001, the Vermont Department of Health worked with a researcher who was at UVM at the time to start monitoring for cyanobacteria. That was in response to a couple of deaths of dogs that were suspected to be caused from cyanobacteria. We don't currently monitor for the presence of cyanobacteria cells in the air. It's relatively unknown how many cyanobacteria cells will aerosolize in the lake waters and the conditions that we have here. We will set up aerosol collectors along the road um, at different intervals. 200 meters, 400 meters, 600 meters, and then I believe a mile. And we are looking to see whether or not aerosol exposure goes out that far and whether then we could back model how far you would have to live to be exposed at what extent. Do you have to be right next to the lake or can you live a mile away from the lake and still be breathing in cyanobacteria and potentially being exposed? It's really important to recognize that ALS is a devastating disease and it does deserve a lot more research. Um, in order to make a strong conclusion about the link between ALS and cyanobacteria, or in order to say that cyanobacteria causes ALS, you need to have some very strong data to support that. So far to date, that strong data has not been available. There's been a lot of local interest and local concern about a possible connection between ALS and cyanobacteria because we are very close to Dartmouth and some of the researchers there are looking into that hypothesis. So we did get a lot of questions about that research. So we wanted to try to put the research into perspective, um, stating that nothing has been proven yet, but that it is an active area of research that we are following. Elijah got a lot of skepticism. I was pretty skeptical of it initially with clusters because clusters are always, you know, people always say, oh, there's a cluster of this and that. And as time has gone on, actually, 
the hard scientific evidence of this has actually gotten better. It's, it's really a compelling story now with some of the models that he's using and the ability to collect the MAA in tissues. And, you know, it's, it's more hard science rather than simply um, putting little pins in a map and saying, oh, the patients, you know, are around this lake. I started noticing David changing early in 2014, and he was starting to slur his speech. But once he started noticing that it was a little harder to talk, he wondered what was going on. And through a number of neurological tests and working with neurologists, first in Burlington and then um, down at Dartmouth, he was diagnosed with ALS. The property that uh, I've taken care of for, uh, since 1990. It's out on Shovel and Point. So Dr. Stummel was trying to make a connection. Possibly there's some neurotoxins on the property. David was really curious about the research and started seeing that there could have been a link with where he lived, how he lived, and the research that Dr. Stompel was involved with. David had lived in Shelburne um, for a number of years, and I didn't find that out about where David had lived until Dave passed away, and I started doing my work with Dr. Stommel. It was in 2016 that I was doing an event um, at All Souls Interfaith Gathering in Shelburne. There was a couple at the event, and I met them. They bought my partner David's house in Shelburne, and they indicated to me that their groundskeeper also had recently been diagnosed with ALS. So there were two people on the same property. I was totally just stopped in my tracks to hear this. You know, I knew about the ALS clusters that Dr. Stommel's looking at along Lake Champlain. Um, but to hear that there was a second person. It's got to be some type of connection with the property or with the lake itself. And we had learned of Dr. Stummel's study when we went to the clinic the first time. I didn't know that he was uh, concerned with environmental toxins and then also the potential for genetic predisposition um, to not handle these toxins. And when we spoke to him, he said that, and that's already had been in my mind. We just know that those things aren't necessarily great for our bodies. This is an issue, I think it's a public health issue that is extremely important to get out. <laughs>